So my name is Sarah Wise. I'm a professor of otolaryngology at Emory University in Atlanta. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Comer and the University of Kentucky for the invitation to um, speak today. I think this is a great forum that they've set up. And uh, hopefully I'll have a few uh, sort of tips and tricks to share with you guys on doing office procedures in rhinology. Uh, these are my disclosures. I think probably the, the thing that relates most to this particular talk is uh, we have a book that came out uh, several years ago called Office-Based Rhinology, um, which has provided uh, a lot of the information in this talk and unfortunately uh, just a small amount of royalties. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about patient selection, equipment needs, and anesthesia for office-based sinonasal procedures. We're gonna look at some of the indications for um, office uh, procedures in rhinology and then spend uh, a few, uh, well, quite a, a substantial amount of time uh, actually on some examples and cases and uh, specifically talk about some of the, tr the tips and tricks around um, doing some of those cases and what can particular be particularly helpful uh, for those individual pathologies. So office rhinology really is a natural progression of what we do sort of every day in our office or what we used to do when our clinics were open and busy. Um, and that is endoscopy and uh, debridement. And if we think back to the original history of endoscopic sinus surgery, um, it was really done without general anesthesia. There was some IV sedation and some topical and local anesthesia, but the patients were um, largely awake. Um, and as I mentioned, we are routinely doing debridements, endoscopies, biopsies, and um, other procedures in our office on awake patients. Um, it really is uh, relatively kind of in the minimally invasive category. And what I'm going to talk about is um, lots of different options for procedures and instrumentation. Um, we certainly can do balloon dilation of the sinuses, but um, the other things that we do can go beyond that as well. When we think about office rhinologic surgery, there are really a lot of advantages for both the physician and the patient. Um, when we choose our procedures appropriately, we can free our OR time for other more involved um, cases. We can avoid general anesthesia. The recovery period is pretty minimal. A lot of these patients will drive themselves in and drive themselves out of the office if they feel that they're able to do that. Um, it tends to be lower cost, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And most patients are um, quite satisfied with the, the procedures that they have received. So we actually did a cost analysis of office-based rhinology procedures that was published in 2012. And of note, this uh, our analysis predated the um, procedure codes for balloon sinus dilation. So this did not um, include those codes um, or those procedures. And so basically what we did was we took um, the procedures that we did in the office and then a, a procedure that was equivalent, but done in the operating room and kind of looked at the overall costs. And we found that if there was no facility fee, that there was um, a, a fairly significant reduction um, of cost to the healthcare system. We also found high patient satisfaction and that most of the patients who did have their procedure in the office um, said that they would still choose it over an OR procedure. Um, and there may be a little bit of bias in that um, in that patient satisfaction because these are patients who had already chosen to do it in the office, um, but they still said that they, um, the vast majority said that they would go ahead and have it done in the office again. As I mentioned, this is uh, our book that came out um, several years back. And so um, a lot of the things that I'll talk about today, as far as principles behind office-based procedures can be found um, detailed in this book as well. So one of the things that I think is most um, important when you're thinking about doing an office-based procedure is really choosing the right patient and choosing the right procedure. 
And so um, because we are frequently scoping patients in the office, a lot of times we've already um, done a, an, a simple nasal endoscopy um, or even a biopsy perhaps on the, the patient that we're discussing doing an office procedure on. And so you have some level of knowledge as to how they reacted to that initial, um, perhaps lower level procedure. A lot of patients um, in the tertiary care rhinology office have also been um, referred from other offices. And so they may have had other nasal endoscopies performed and they can actually tell you if, they're, if they tend to be relatively tolerant or intolerant to them. You can generally judge a patient's level of anxiety as well. Um, and, and sometimes we'll have knowledge of whether or not patients have had prior procedures in our office. So for example, I'm going to present um, in a little bit a case of a recurrent polyposis on a patient that I had previously operated on. So this is a patient that I know has had nasal endoscopies and debridements performed by me as well as surveillance nasal endoscopies. And so it, as I present the idea of having um, a revision polypectomy, I, I generally have knowledge of how that particular patient is going to react. Um, and then also, uh, we wanna make sure that our patients have a thorough understanding of what we are proposing, um, how long the patient's gonna, how long the procedure is gonna take, what they're you know, going to experience, what our actual goals and expectations of the procedure may be, and then the risks. Um, and as far as the procedure itself, we wanna think about the, where the pathology is located. Is it a, a place within the nasal and sinus cavities that we're gonna be able to reach uh, appropriately with our instruments in an awake patient? Um, what is the extent of the pathology? How long is the procedure going to take? Can we um, appropriately anesthetize the area? Do we have the right equipment in our office? And what is our expectation of bleeding? So as you kind of go through all of those things in your mind and discuss with the patient, uh, if you get this reaction, you may not uh, decide to do that procedure in the office. But if the patient has more of a reaction like this, then you might be you might have found the right patient um, for that. Another thing that I will mention is um, essentially anything that we do in the office could also be done in the operating room. Uh, and so when I am discussing the possibility of doing a procedure uh, in the office with a patient, I get also give them the option of going to the operating room and kind of discuss the various pros and cons of each and what would be involved in each and then ultimately let them make their own decision. Um, and I will offer um, suggestions and recommendations um, as well um, to help, you know, to help them kind of come to their ultimate decision if they require that. Uh, with regard to informed consent, we want to think about the fact that regardless of the procedure that we're doing, um, the risks that are inherent to a procedure are inherent to that procedure, regardless of the location where we're performing it. So, um, you know, if we are doing essentially an endoscopic sinus surgery in the office, if we're going to do a maxillary antrostomy or an ethmoidectomy or um, you know, resectomidal turbinate or something like that, then those procedures have the same risks that that, that that particular procedure would have in the operating room. And we want to fully disclose those risks to the patient. So we should not um, discount or trivialize our informed consent discussion. Uh, so when we think about the elements of informed consent, we want to fully explain the procedure that we're going to do and discuss the alternatives. So um, the alternative to an office-based procedure is certainly an OR-based procedure. And many of the procedures that we are discussing have medical therapy or observation, simple observation as an option. So we want to fully disclose the alternatives as well. We wanna talk about the risks and benefits, not only of having the procedure, but also declining the procedure. And we wanna make sure that during that discussion, the patient is fully um, giving us our, their full attention uh, 
they're competent to make the decision and that we are not um, as the surgeon or physician performing the procedure that we're not being coercive or intimidating. So with all of that in mind, um, what are some of the possible procedures that we can do in the office? I think some of these are, um, these pathologies are inherent things that we think that think of when we um, think of an office procedure, um, like taking care of turbinate hypertrophy, uh, biopsies, removing polyps, um, treating sinus outflow tract stenosis, either with balloon dilation or an actual um, sinusotomy. Some of the lateral nasal wall treatments for valve collapse and cryotherapy, but there are also some procedures in here that um, we may not necessarily have thought about um, before. And so uh, we'll touch on uh, various aspects of, of uh, some of these as we go through this presentation. As far as um, anesthesia, there, uh, the vast majority of what we do in the office is done with uh, some combination of topical anesthesia and then local injections. Um, honestly, although you certainly could do uh, some type of block, nerve block, I uh, personally cannot remember the last time I did this for an office procedure. Um, I don't use any sedation. Um, if you do, you know, do some kind of conscious sedation, then you typically have to be uh, credentialed for that and have the appropriate monitoring equipment. Um, I do want to note that occasionally patients will ask, you know, they'll say, oh, I have, um, you know, I have some uh, uh, Valium or Xanax or Ativan at home. Do you mind if I take that before I come? Um, if that is the case, then typically what I'll do is I'll make sure that we um, fully have the informed consent discussion um, before the procedure visit where they're going to take that, um, that medication. And so we've already obtained the informed consent within the appropriate time before the procedure. And then on the day that the procedure is scheduled, if, um, if it's on a separate day and they wanna take a, a medication, then they can go ahead and do that. Um, and, and I do tell them that if they're gonna take some type of um, medication that will make them less, you know, um, some type of anxiolytic or something like that, that they need to have a driver with them. Um, as far as topical anesthesia, um, in the office, we typically use oxymetazoline and lidocaine, um, and that's usually in a mixture. Uh, the way that I will apply the topical anesthesia is to use initially um, at least traditionally, we've done a nebulized uh, spray um, that may be changing in the post-COVID era, but um, traditionally it's been a nebulized spray. And then I will actually apply that same mixture to either cottonoid pledgets or cotton balls and um, place those initially in the anterior nasal cavity. Um, one thing that is important to learn when you are starting to do office-based procedures is a lot of the discomfort that patients experience comes from what the pressure and um, pain that they feel in their anterior nasal cavity, especially when the nasal septum is um, touched by the scope or an instrument. So if you can get that anterior nasal septum very, very um, anesthetized, then a lot of times your procedure will go much more smoothly. And so I will oftentimes layer um, cotton balls soaked with um, topical anesthetic and decongestant or cottonoid pledgets in the anterior nasal cavity and let them sit for five to 10 minutes and then I will do that again and place them um, a bit more place new um, cotton or cottonoid pledgets more posteriorly, um, sort of along the anterior aspect of the middle turbinate, middle meatus, sphenoethmoid recess, um, if I'm doing uh, something more posteriorly, etc. cetera. Um, inject, certainly local injections can be performed uh, similar to what we do in the operating room. What I will uh, also advise with local injections is that if you're injecting turbinates, um, lots of us note that in the operating room when we inject turbinates, we do get a little bit of 
spike in the um, in the blood pressure and heart rate, and certainly that can happen in um, the, the awake patient as well, uh, and they will notice it. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, you know you don't have uh, someone with a lot of comorbidities if you're going to be injecting a turbinate that's um, that's quite vascular. So just some uh, sort of trip tips and tricks around uh, topical and local anesthetic. As far as equipment, uh, what we have in our office, um, we have zero degree and um, various angled scopes, 30 degree, 45 degree, and 70 degree angled endoscopes. We all ha also have um, pediatric sized uh, rigid endoscopes so that we can see things with lots of different angles and, um, and kind of uh, make our scopes go into um, the appropriate locations. Um, we also in our office have various types of sinus surgery hand instruments, various curettes, through cutting instruments, uh, non through cutting forceps, frontal instruments, sphenoid punch, um, grasping forceps, etc. And each of these is individually peel packed. Um, at, in comparison to the operating room where you would have uh, a large surgical tray with lots of instruments and you would open that for your case, that uh, tends to be less efficient in the, um, in the office suite because usually you only need a handful of instruments, uh, maybe one, two, or three instruments to accomplish a procedure. Uh, and so you can select those individual instruments uh, that are individually peel packed, open what you need, and then um, clean only what you've used. With regard to um, some of the other sort of powered instrumentation, um, we, we have a debrider in our office uh, as well. Um, we have a coblator, radio frequency device, or lots of um, different powered type instruments. I know um, some practices that have bipolar cautery um, and you know different types of cautery instrumentation. So um, depending on what you are going to be performing in your office, the appropriate powered instrumentation can certainly be helpful. Um, I do want to make a quick statement about procedure indications. So as I mentioned before, um, the procedure indications, if you're going to do a procedure, the indications are generally the same. So if, if you have an indication for a procedure, that indication is going to be the same whether you're doing it in the operating room versus the office. However, selecting your patient may differ. So um, that's where the whole um, as, you know, the whole aspect of the patient being receptive to the procedure, being appropriate, um, you know, having a, a reasonable level of anxiety, but not an, uh, an overwhelming level of anxiety, et cetera. So um, the other thing that I'll mention is that um, oftentimes I will get asked the question from, from patients, is if I do this in the office, is it going to be as good as what you would do in the operating room? And in some cases, my honest answer to that is no. Um, so we'll take polypectomy, uh, for example. If I'm doing a revision polypectomy on a patient that um, has had for example, a full house vest before, and they just have recurrent soft tissue polyposis, um, generally what I tell them is that what I can accomplish in the office is probably going to be surgically about 80 to 85 percent of what I could accomplish in the operating room. Meaning that I may not, um, you know, completely skeletonize the skull base, uh, to be completely free of polyps in the office, um, so, you know, for example. However, by removing the vast majority of polyposis in the office, I can then provide an avenue for medical treatment to work 
as best as it can. So by clearing out polyposis that you know, may be hanging in the nasal cavity, extending towards the nasal floor, filling the ethmoid cavity, extending into the maxillary ostium, et cetera, if I'm able to clear out the vast majority of that and create a pathway for topical steroid therapy again, then in the end, um, six weeks, eight weeks later, the results from, that I would have achieved in the operating room and the office are probably going to be equivalent. Um, but the immediate surgical result may not be exactly the same. So I think that that's an important conversation to have with the patients and make sure that they um, understand that. And, um, and, you know, most patients, if they're leaning towards an office procedure, will ultimately say that, you know, in the end, if the, res if the final result is going to be the same, then I understand you may not be able to provide 100% of the surgery that you would provide in the operating room. Um, and they, a lot of patients, um, if they're leaning towards an office procedure, will ultimately choose that based on convenience and avoidance of general anesthesia. So with that, um, I'll, I'll pause for just a moment to see if anyone has any questions um, so that, and before we move on to some cases. And so um, if anyone has any questions, if you can just speak up, I can't, the way that my screen is configured, I can't quite see the chat area right now. I'll certainly answer that later, but um, if anyone has any questions that they want to verbalize, I can certainly take them. Okay, so we'll move on to a few cases then. Um, this is, this first case, is a, um, a 34 year old woman with CRS with nasal polyps who had uh, endoscopic sinus surgery by me uh, four years prior. She has asthma as well as um, allergic rhinitis, no AFRS or AERD. Um, on subcutaneous immunotherapy and um, does twice a day budesonide irrigations with very good compliance, um, comes to all of her office visits. Um, and she is generally treated with prednisone about once a year for acute exacerbations. Um, although recently, because she uh, has a couple of young children, that has been a little bit more frequent. And she comes complaining of orbital impression, uh, pressure and mild congestion, and this has not been responsive to a couple of recent courses of um, prednisone. Um, and she tolerates uh, endoscopy and debridement very well in the office. And so you can see an, an example endoscopic view here with um, clear polyp recurrence. Um, you can also see on the scan, um, she's had decent sinus surgery. Um, she's got some left frontal opacification that extends to the anterior ethmoid, um, and the rest of her sinuses are uh, generally in good shape. So in this particular patient, um, I offered her a revision polypectomy in the office. And uh, a couple of things I want to point out here is you can see kind of the watery nature of this patient's polyps. Um, they're, they look like nice, juicy polyps that just want to um, come out very nicely into the debrider. We're in the left um, ethmoid cavity. You can see the maxillary sinus um, down here at about uh, five o'clock. There's middle turbinate. Um, so the debrider is um, just slowly and carefully um, chewing up those polyps. You can see into the posterior ethmoid cavity, polyps come nicely into the debrider. And so basically just working progressively um, on kind of taking these polyps out. So this particular patient um, had 
essentially just topical anesthesia on, um, on cotton balls or cottonoid pledgets uh, along with decongestion, as I mentioned before. No local injection, um, just really good topical anesthesia progressively placed from the anterior nasal cavity then working back in order to appropriately anesthetize the area. Mm -hmm. I'm going to contrast that with polyps that I think are not as ideal for an office-based procedure. Mm -hmm. And so this is a patient with um, AERD. I apologize, the video is a little bit old, but I think you can get the idea. So these, um, you can see that this is substantially more bloody. Um, this is a recurrent AERD case. Um, a lot of in these cases, the polyps are very thick fibrous, um, quite a bit more bloody. They tend to be, I call them little, um, the little punching bags. They want to um, run away from the debrider rather than being sucked up in it. So that uh, is kind of a less than ideal case, these very, very um, fibrous polyps. And also you can see this thick mucin, which we know whether we're in the operating room or in the office, this can kind of be a bear to uh, remove. So um, a lot of times I try to avoid doing these in office because it's just, um, it takes a, a, quite a bit longer to get a good result and um, can be more bloody and also more uncomfortable for the patient. Cool. So in thinking about polypectomy in the office, um, when we are considering doing a primary polypectomy, so in patients that have not had prior sinus surgery, this can be very helpful if there are um, middle turbinate polyps, so a solitary kind of coming from the middle turbinate. Um, it, and that is often seen with patients with allergy. That's um, something that's been described by us and several other um, institutions around the world. Um, so that can be helpful if there are limited polyps. If you have a, um, also if you have a patient that you intend to take to the operating room later, um, but they need other comorbidities worked out. Um, things like um, if they have, you know, need a, a significant cardiac workup, if they're pregnant, um, things like that. For revision, we, I think that the case that I showed is probably the ideal case. Um, if they've had prior um, surgery, if they have few or um, no ethmoid septations, that's um, a benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and then we frequently get asked about bleeding. Um, bleeding is usually minimal in these cases, um, as long as you're, they're appropriately chosen. So I think that's for um, several reasons. We're not using an inhalational anesthetic, so you're not getting the vasodilation there. The patient is also sitting upright, so they're not um, having positional engorgement of the nasal vessels. Um, but we do have to consider, as I've mentioned before, if you have a very anxious patient, they may end up with some hypertension and tachycardia that could increase bleeding. Mm -hmm. But in general, mm -hmm. I have not experienced significant bleeding um, with mm -hmm. office polypectomy. Okay, um, the second case I'm going to present is a 48-year-old man who comes with CRS for many years um, and feels like he's been worsening for about four months. He's requesting a second opinion. His complaints are mucoid drainage and congestion at baseline, um, but having intermittent flares. He has had four prior fesses elsewhere, as well as an inferior turbinate reduction. Um, he has been treated, uh, I hope that I, I can impart to you that he has had extensive medical treatment, PO and IV antibiotics, IV antifungals, um, dexamethasone injections, uh, nasal topical an uh, antibiotics, steroids, and antifungals. Recently was started on IVIG because he was advised that he might have CVID. So, um, this is a patient who has had uh, what I would say is extensive medical therapy for his sinusitis. He has a CBC within normal limits, except um, he does have some elevated eosinophils, which is not surprising uh, for a patient with uh, sinusitis history, especially if he had polyposis. Um, they thought that he may be having viral infections, but he did not uh, have any viral um, positivities on a swab. Um, he did have 
several, um, he actually had IgG with, uh, or immunoglobulins with IgG subclasses tested a few times um, with only IgG1 uh, ever being in the low range. And the lowest was um, 340 and he had appropriate um, host vaccination uh, strep pneumotiters. Um, so it appears that he has um, decent immune function. So this is his CT scan that he comes in with. And so we'll just kind of let this scroll from anterior to posterior, our coronal view, we see um, basically uh, essentially clear frontal sinuses. Um, we'll see a little bit of a small amount of scattered uh, mucosal disease, but the sinus ostia appear to be open. I'm gonna highlight this one little area of um, what appears to be kind of a mucus blob um, at the left maxillary sinus using the scientific term mucus blob. Um, but basically, I would say, um, as I kind of looked through this scan, my initial reaction was, eh. I would say that this particular scan um, did not excite me compared to the amount of treatment that this particular patient had had. So, um, you know, he does have clinical symptoms, um, but it, it seemed like this was a really extensive amount of medical treatment for um, the amount of disease seen on the scan. So what did we see endoscopically? Um, so looking in with a 45 degree endoscope with particular attention to that area of the mucus blob at the left maxillary sinus, you can see that there was clearly some non-infected mucus there. Um, and then we see basically a posterior accessory surgical osteum and then the anterior natural maxillary osteum. So this patient basically had simple maxillary sinus mucus recirculation, um, which explains his baseline level of congestion and intermittent flares. So when that mucus just sitting there, it can cause some congestion. When it does get infected, it can cause some um, acute flare-ups. So this is something that can be easily treated in the office. Um, angled endoscope is important to identify it. Um, see the natural osteum, see the separate surgical osteum, and uh, basically clip that with a through cutting instrument. And you wanna make sure that you really um, get a good separation of that scar band or that bony partition in order to um, make sure that it, does that it doesn't reform. Mucus recirculation can have um, some more complicated looks to it as well. Um, this is a patient of one of my partners, um, John Delgadio, who it's, this is also a left maxillary sinus. You can see an inferior meatal window um, which is an old sinus surgery technique. Um, you can see the inferior turbinate, which has, um, ha looks like it's had some surgery there. And there are actually several openings into the maxillary sinus. And you can see that the mucus was removed um, initially. And basically the treatment is to uh, connect all of these and make a single osteum into the maxillary sinus. Um, so this is gonna involve a little bit of bone removal. And um, basically anytime you're removing bone in the clinic, you want to uh, advise the patients that they're going to hear a little bit of um, crunching and snapping, which can be very, quite loud in their head. Um, that is probably the most anxiety provoking thing for the patient, not the actual uh, discomfort or performance of the procedure, but that sound of the bone cracking. So. Um, important to let them know that they may hear that and not to be alarmed by it. So um, you can see how the single osteum is created there. So a couple of tips about mucus recirculation, you've got to look for it. Um, so that's number one, two, and three. The muc mucosal thickening on the CT around the osteum is helpful. You've um, also, angled scopes um, really must be used 
zero degree scopes often miss this. You could see on the video, even with the 45 degree scope, um, you still really had to look around the corner. Um, topical anesthetic and decongestant, I've already talked about that. Um, and then endoscopic hand instruments essentially can help to take care of it. Um, the next case I'm going to present just quickly is a 21-year-old woman with nasal obstruction, recent immigrant um, to the U.S., um, has tried various nasal sprays, although the specific medications were um, prior use were unknown, um, currently on mometasone, um, had intranasal surgery in her home country, um, on endoscopy basically saw inferior turbinate hypertrophy, um, but it was, it was unclear exactly what surgery had been performed previously. So this patient uh, seemed to be a good candidate for radiofrequency treatment of the inferior turbinates. Um, so I'll typically um, perform, again, topical um, decongestion. And then the local that I inject, um, I usually just inject uh, a local anesthetic uh, without epinephrine. Um, this is the Ceylon device, uh, basically placed uh, in multiple uh, areas within the turbinate. And then when you step on the pedal, there's um, kind of a beeping sound and you can see the um, radio frequency treatment occurring there. You want to make sure that you're um, submucosal um, to reduce the ulceration. So I mentioned before, turbinates are vascular. Um, you wanna, I, I generally have patients discontinue anticoagulants or antiplatelet medications. Um, and I found that devices that um, provide some uh, cautery are probably better for the office. Debreeders tend to cause a little bit more bleeding in the office, but some people use them. That just happens to be my um, recommendation. Um, out fracturing certainly can be done. It may be less tolerated. I usually, again, tell the patient if I'm going to do this, that they may feel some, um, they may hear some bone cracking. Um, and then um, occasionally with the radio frequency device, I've had patients say that they, um, they can kind of feel a little bit of an electrical twinge when it's first turned on. Um, Usually that it is helped by making sure that the, um, the shaft of the device is not resting against their ALA. Um, so I try to make sure and, and look for that before I actually turn it on. Um, one other quick uh, case that can be helpful for rhinorrhea. Um, so 36 year old woman with chronic bilateral rhinorrhea um, occurs day and night, um, non-mucoid, no apparent triggers, allergy testing, unremarkable. Beta-2 transferrin was performed just because of um, her specific complaints of the amount of rhinorrhea, but that was negative. Um, she's tried several medications, currently, um, or at the initial time, was using cetirizine, ipratropium, and flutigazone, and felt that this um, improved her symptoms about 50% compared to when she was using no medications at all. Um, this is actually a patient that I had taken care of um, several years before and had had a, a best four years prior that um, resolved some CRS symptoms that she was having now, um, and, and these symptoms were distinctly different. Um, I also had taken her in the interim um, when she initially complained of the rhinorrhea for a posterior nasal neurectomy um, where you basically lift the mucosa of the posterior lateral and uh, inferior region um, and then place uh, like a little allodrome graft in there. And that helped her um, with her rhinorrhea, reduced it by about 50% for about two years. So she got a little bit of, um, she got some benefit from this. She also gets some benefit likely from the ipratropium, which I think is important um, to think about. Um, so the innervation of the posterior lateral nasal mucosa, there are um, several small um, neural fibers that kind of come through there that can be many, many branches, uh, as described by Blyer and Schlosser uh, in this region, kind of as the um, middle turbinate comes into the lateral nasal wall and attaches around this uh, sphenopalatine foramen. So um, one of the treatments that's offered, potentially offered for this is this uh, cryotherapy device. Um, it's called Clarifix. And you can see here in this particular patient, she had had a previous maxillary entrostomy. It's certainly not necessary to perform that in order to do this, but this is the patient's left side. The device is inserted and um, inflated 
with the um, liquid nitrogen and then deflated, let cool off and then removed. It's important to let it cool off before you remove it because you don't want to um, pull the mucosa out and create a large ulcer there. Um, so it's actually pretty, a pretty easy um, procedure to do. Um, I want to highlight that the nasal anatomy should be appropriate for the device and the instrument. A severe septal deviation can um, be, uh, can impede the actual placement of the device. Um, so you want to make sure that the, the um, anatomy is appropriate, appropriate. I do place some topical anesthesia, um, also do some uh, local injections, um, but sometimes the patients do end up with um, an ice cream headache. And I've had one patient complain that that lasted for about 12 hours, um, which sounds terrible to me. Um, but that was definitely an outlier for me. Um, I haven't done a, an enormous amount of these, but uh, most people tolerate it uh, quite well. Um, the results may take a little while to, to sh um, show up. Um, the, I've heard from the company maybe up to 90 days. Um, and this can reportedly be helpful in rhinorrhea and in non-allergic and allergic rhinitis. The last case I'm going to present, um, I think this is a, a good uh, demonstration of some of the more advanced things that we can do in the office. And I have to thank uh, my partner, Dr. Delgadio, for this case. I just think this is a great, this has a great video and shows a great example of um, this particular type of um, procedure. So, so this is a 63-year-old who had had endoscopic sinus surgery about 10 years ago, developed progressive dip diplopia and frontal headache. You can see a little bit of a bulge here on the, in the uh, left sort of superior medial orbit. And endoscopy on the left side uh, essentially showed this um, sort of bulge here um, in the anterior superior region. On CT scan, um, we can see a large mucosal of the left frontal sinus with extension um, and some dehiscence of the orbit. Uh, and I think the important thing to note is that as we follow this into the nasal cavity, that's really the only structure that we see. And so um, by translation, that bulge on endoscopy should therefore be that mucosal. There is some right frontal sinus disease, but the patient's acute complaints relate to the left. So um, injecting that um, mucosal area on the left, you actually, with the injection, you start to get some mucosal fluid. So that actually leads you right to the spot that you should open. Um, so with, uh, it's very similar to doing this in the OR, so medial in away from the orbital dehiscence, opening into that mucosal, um, and you can get some very satisfying um, drainage of this type of mucosal in the clinic. Um, and you want to just make sure that that's fully marsupialized and open, just like you would in the operating room, um, and, and um, can very, very uh, quickly alleviate the, the patient's um, orbital pressure. So um, mucus seals can be drained in the office. You want to operate in the safest area to avoid complication. Um, if there are dehiscences, remember that the contents may shift. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, bone erosion is not necessarily a contraindication. You just want to be aware of it. Um, know what you're doing. Know where you're operating. Um, and even if the procedure is not absolutely definitive, um, so for example, this patient still eventually needed to go to the OR and have that right frontal sinus taken care of, uh, they can be helpful, this can be helpful for acute symptoms. So um, my take home points today, um, appropriate patient selection. I cannot stre stress that enough, appropriate selection of pathology. Um, Generally, patient satisfaction is high. I think that one of the things that um, makes it high is that uh, if, if you ensure that they are appropriately selected, appropriately prepared, appropriately anesthetized, and um, talk them through the procedure, that um, you know, it helps to kind of uh, make the patient that you're, realize that you're holding their hands the whole way. Um, these can potentially decrease cost uh, to the healthcare system, and then uh, I encourage you to start small um, and then let your experience grow. So uh, I thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'm gonna kind of head back here and maybe I can, 
Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that I can perhaps um, see some of these, see if there's any questions. It looks like there's still um, some questions from when Dr. Hatcher was talking. Um, let's see. Are patients open to residents being involved in office-based procedures? Um, I think that that is, in my experience, that is uh, patient dependent. Some of them are, um, are very open to the idea. Um, and especially in something like, some, something where you have uh, two sides, for example. Um, so treatment of the inferior turbinates um, is often done bilaterally. If you're doing something to treat the nasal valves, that is often done bilaterally. So a lot of times, um, if I have a patient that I think is going to be receptive to a um, resident or fellow partic actively participating, um, then I will, um, I will myself do the first side. And as long as that goes well, then I will introduce the idea of um, a, the resident or fellow doing the other side. And I have had some patients be recept receptive. Um, honestly, you, you know, it's hard to know what they're going to say, and they have the right to say uh, yes or no. So, um, uh, but yeah, it, I think that, uh, you know, depending on how you handle it, 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 uh, it certainly um, can, can happen. Um, someone has asked how long it takes to perform full topical anesthesia. Um, so it can take a while. As I've mentioned, I'll, um, you know, initially uh, kind of anesthetize the anterior nasal cavity with, um, with cotton or cottonoid pledgets and then kind of do another uh, level a little bit more posteriorly and then, you know, the, potentially the sphenoethmoid recess or the, um, you know, cotton or pledgets directly into the middle meatus. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't stay in the room with those patients the whole time. Um, in general, what I will do is I, when I book a procedure in the clinic, I will book it for uh, a bit longer than my typical office visit. So um, I'll usually book a procedure for about 30 minutes. It can be potentially 45 minutes or so, depending on what I'm going to do. Um, but basically, I will be having my other, seeing my other clinic patients at that time. So when the patient initially comes in, I will um, talk to them, get the consent if that's not already done. I will put the initial, um, you know, topical cotton in the anterior nose. I will leave, go and see another patient, um, you know, typically another quick visit with another patient, come back, take that cotton out, put another set of cotton in, go and see another patient. So, um, so it's not a giant lag in the clinic. I'm still, you know, efficiently carrying on with the clinic. Um, and then when I go back in to do the procedure, most of the time, if they have, if they are adequately anesthetized topically, um, then I will go ahead and, and do the procedure. And it's usually actually quite um, quick. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, that's as you can, you can find other ways to be efficient in the clinic while you're still doing procedures. Um, another question, have I ever had to mobilize to the operating room while doing an in-office procedure? Um, so for, um, for a scheduled procedure where I have, have you know, discussed with the patient in advance that we're going to do a procedure, bring them into the clinic, go through all these steps. I've never had to, um, you know, stop the procedure for some type of complication or something like that and take them to the operating room. I have had patients that I have set up for a procedure and started the, um, you know, numbing them up or, or you know, started um, 
the very initial parts of the procedure and quickly realized that they were uh, becoming too anxious or um, perhaps having a, a little presyncopal episode as sometimes happens in the rhinology clinic. And I've actually myself suggested that we just um, do it in the operating room instead. Uh, but I've never had to, you know, deep into a procedure, I've never had to take, uh, stop doing it and take someone to the operating room. Um, I have certainly had episodes where um, we've agreed to see something like a nosebleed in the clinic. And then when the patient comes in, um, it's, we have realized it's not something that we can um, definitively stop in the clinic. And, and so then we've placed packing and, uh, and gone to the OR for something like an SPA ligation. Um, so those things certainly happen, but, um, but I've never had to, I've never been deep into a procedure and had some sort of issue where I have to take the patient immediately to the OR. Are there any other questions before I give you guys a short break uh, to get ready for the next lecture? Sarah, thank you for your lecture. That was that was fantastic. That um, it's neat to see how people at different institutions are pushing it further and further with office procedures and otherwise. So thank you for joining us for this.